The father of the Quincy and the son of the Soul King, the final villain of the Bleach manga Yuhaba is an incredible character that I have wanted to break down and analyse ever since I started doing character analysis videos on this channel. Like with most of Kubo's character writing, when it comes to Yuhaba, it has been done through very subtle storytelling and we have to piece together the narrative as it isn't told to us in a linear manner. Unlike Aizen, the leader of the Quincy did not want to play the role of God. He is in fact a messianic figure who was born with godlike attributes attributes and it is for this reason that he does not need to transcend to the level of God since he was born at that level. This is all further emphasised with his overpowered broken ability the Almighty which allows him to see and alter any possible future so that he can have his desired outcome in the present. This power is described as being all knowing and all powerful. It is his form of omniscience which of course is a key attribute of God in many faiths. From his name, ideals and personality it is evident that he and his underlings have been inspired from Abrahamic concepts, like how the Quincy holy forms allow the Stenritus to transform themselves into grotesque fearsome beings, similar to how angels or Oppenheim are described within Hebrew text as having four wheels with rims full of eyes. So just from this very brief introduction, you can tell that there is a lot to unpack about Yuhabak. The aim of this video is to put some respect on his name. I will explain why he is more than just an OP villain with an overflowing cool moustache. With the anime adaptation of the Thousand Year Blood War around the corner, hopefully this video will explain why Yuhabak was a key villain that the story of Bleach was building up to. Before the video begins, only 20% of the people who actually watch my content are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy these videos, then subscribe and stick around for more content just like this. Now let's get back to the topic of the video. Yuhabak makes his debut appearance within chapter 484 of the manga and hopefully within the first episode of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. He is one of the most important characters in the series and he plays a key role as the endgame villain of Bleach. He is connected to our protagonist through being responsible for the death of his mother, as well well as Oman Zangetsu who is based upon Yuhabak's physical form from 1000 years ago. Through this we can imagine how he must have looked during the first war between the Quincy and the Shinigami. Oman Zangetsu was in actuality a physical manifestation of Ichigo's Quincy powers that he had inherited from his mother. It is for this reason that he has taken up the form of the father of all Quincy. This is why in some way he has been with us since the very beginning of the story. We knew that Oman Zangetsu had a fatherly bond with Ichigo and this is echoed through how Yuhabak constantly refers to Ichigo as a son. Yuhabak is also the son of the Soul King and through information that we learn via the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels, we understand why he disdains the reality that the five great noble families and Ichibei had helped to create. I will speak more about this when I cover Yuhabak's fate after the Thousand Year Blood War arc and I'll cover all of the information that we learn about him in the light novels. Yuha can be described as a towering menacing middle-aged man. His long black hair complements his overall aesthetic of being shrouded in darkness. The Quincy King has brown eyes, a long nose and a signature moustache that connects to his long sideburns. Visually speaking, he is very intimidating, especially with his sharp glare that he uses to submit his subordinates to his will. His majestic demeanour is visually conveyed through how Kubo designs his clothing, making it apparent that he is an imperial leader. He is cloaked in a black and red cloth that is tied together over his left shoulder. Underneath his cloak, he wears the signature white military attire of the Wanden Reich. He undergoes a great deal of change after he completely absorbs the Soul King as he is covered by an oozing darkness which is decorated with multiple eyes. The eyes that surround him in this form visually represent his power to foresee every possible future so that he can change it in order to bring about his desired outcome. This form that he takes up towards the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc is very intimidating and unsettling. It is a fascinating contrast that the Shinigami who represent Grim Reapers play the role of heroes who often harness beautiful powers in the form of their bankai, while the Quincy who represent angels take up such creepy and horrific appearances, especially in their holy forms. Yuhabak is no exception to this as he also has an additional two irises on each of his eyes adding to his disturbing appearance when he activates his power the almighty. I can't speak about Yuhabak's appearance without mentioning the fascination that fans have had with his mighty moustache. Throughout the course of the manga, avid students of Kubology had noticed that 
Juhobak's moustache had undergone a considerable amount of growth during his many appearances. Fans had started to correlate the length of his moustache to his ever-growing strength and power. In Dragon Ball, Goku's hair on his head visually represents his growth in power, while on the other hand, Yuhobak had demonstrated his rise in power through his magnificent stash. This character is written with a clear goal that makes even more sense after reading the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels. His desire was to create a world without the fear of death. He aimed to achieve this by combining together the three realms of the human world, Soul Society and Hueco Mundo, as they were centuries ago prior to the appointment of the Soul King as the linchpin of reality. The current rule of the Shinigami angers Yuhobak. He gains the power to resist against them by killing others and absorbing their power, like how he had done nine years prior to the invasion of the Soul Society when he had first awakened and robbed the impure Quincy of their powers, resulting in most of their deaths. Speaking of his revival and how he gains power, after examining Yuhobak further, I can't help but to notice that he continues to share similarity with Abrahamic concepts when we compare his role in the story to the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yuhobak in a way represents the Quincy Holy Trinity, through how he is the father of all of the Quincy, he is the son of the Soul King, who is the god of the Bleach World, and lastly he represents the Holy Spirit through how each of his Quincy children, including Ichigo, have a piece of his soul within them, and this of course is the source of their Quincy power. Through being the son of the Soul King, Yuhobak is in some way a figurative Quincy Jesus, while on the other hand he is like an antichrist to the Shinigami, who find existence with the fear of death an acceptable reality. Yuhobak is the sustainer of all Quincy. He holds in high regard any of his children who would die for his sake. It is thanks to the sacrifice of the victims of Ushualin that he had regained his power. In addition to all of this, he has several themes written into his character, like the duality between despair and hope, as well as death and courage. The theme of despair and hope is explored through his interactions with Ichigo, and the concepts of death and courage reference his fear of death and the overarching theme of Bleach as a story, which is given closure at the end of the manga through Aizen's speech about courage. The motive of Yuhobak can only really be appreciated once you understand the truth about reality and how the Soul King had came into being. You would totally appreciate Yuhobak's desire to destroy the Shinigami because of their sins. During the Thousand Year Blood War arc, he had foresaw a future where Ichibei would force Ichigo to become the next Soul King. This is a brutal process whereby the unfortunate individual has their limbs severed and their free will taken from them in order to play the role of an absent god who holds reality together against their will. This was revealed during the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels and was hinted at when Shunsui had visited the real world, giving Ichigo's friends passes so that they could come to visit him. But with what we know, they would see a version of their friend who is dismembered and contained within a living coffin, trapped there for eternity. Another fascinating theory that I have had since the release of the new Breathes From Hell special chapter is that Yuhobak had sacrificed his underlings to gain their power because he had saved them from dying and ending up in hell. The special chapter had revealed that if an individual's Reishi is too dense, then it cannot be broken down and reabsorbed into the Soul Society. This is why the Shinigami performed the Konso Reisei to send their comrades to hell. From this one ritual, you can see that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way that the Shinigami maintained the order and balance of reality. Another example is how Mairi had killed hundreds of civilians in Rukongai in order to maintain the balance of souls after a large amount of hollows had been killed by the Quincy at the very start of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. The outright morally wrong decisions made by the Soul Society hint at the truth of the Bleach world and the underlying motive of Yuhobak. In my opinion, his character has the most pivotal motive. He has a solid backstory supporting his goal and there is enough difference between him and Aizen to make their respective character arcs distinctive and meaningful. Aizen is admittedly more humorous and he enjoys toying with his victims, while Yuhobak, as the leader of an empire, he strategically engages in a war without the need for playing games, or being a mischievous trickster, Yuhobak is a godlike being who after 1000 years regains his power to continue his goal of overthrowing the Shinigami. He is a great endgame villain to bring the story of Bleach to a close. People say that Yuhobak is broken because of his ability to foresee the future and to defeat any opponent by hacking his way into the future that he chooses. I believe that this is a character flaw that has been written to reflect his desire to change reality, so that he doesn't have to face death.
His fear of death is indicative of an individual who lacks the traits of courage and bravery. When he takes part in battle, he does not do so bravely, since he can alter the outcome to one where he wins. He does not know what it feels like to fight with an uncertainty of your opponent winning. He has never had to worry about this. Now, some would mistake this as fearlessness, but I think that it proves that he is cowardly. After all, he is a godlike being who is relying too heavily on a power like the Almighty. When it comes to controlling his underlings, he does so by dividing and ruling them. They are constantly after his approval and would not dare to backstab him, since he has the ability to reabsorb the power that he has bestowed upon them. All of his actions are underpinned by the emotion of fear. He fears loss, betrayal, the uncertainty of a future he cannot foresee, and ultimately, Yuhobak fears death. The name Yuhobak was given to him by people who had worshipped him when he was just a child, as they had named him after their very own god because of his miraculous powers. The first portion of the YH is directly inspired from the name of the Hebrew god Yahweh. The second half of his name is derived from the German aesthetic of the Quincy. The German word Wach translates to awake, so his name is God Awake, which can be interpreted as the God who is awake. Emphasizing his godly nature and his abilities that manifest eyes all over his body, which visually symbolize his awakened state. The confined Quincy King lay dormant for 1000 years, but he has finally awakened to regain the world and shape it in his image. Yuha claims to love peace, citing his opposition to conflict, but he draws a line when it comes to the death of his children. Hypocritically, he opposes anyone who would dare to kill his subordinates, but he has no problem with sacrificing them for what he believes is the greater good. He feared death, but he had no issue with bringing death upon his underlings. Some even theorize that he had become more ruthless and unforgiving after he had absorbed the Soul King, because in the end, he even had performed a Shwalan on his most loyal soldiers, the Schutstaffel, including his right hand man Hashwald. Maybe he had begun to understand the suffering of his father, the Soul King, after he had absorbed him. Understanding the humiliating existence that he had to endure may have been what had pushed Yuhobak to the edge, but he was willing to sacrifice everything to change reality, so that another Soul King would not be born, and that the concept of death would cease to exist. The father and son connection between Yuhobak and the Soul King further explains his reasons for waging war against the Soul Society. We know that Yuhobak could not stand the existence of his father father as the Soul King. The process of becoming this linchpin involved the Soul King being mutilated and sealed away, to make sure that the real world, Soul Society and Hueco Mundo don't collapse into each other. Along with his desire to get rid of the concept of death, he wishes to end the humiliating existence of his father. Yuhobak's desire to kill the Soul King is so intense that it also flows through the blood of every other Quincy, thus explaining why Ichigo had killed the Soul King when he had tried to remove the sword that had impaled him. Ichigo is referred to by Yuhobak as his son who was born in the dark. This is because Ichigo has a piece of his soul within him. The Quincy blood that he inherits from his mother is the piece of Yuhobak's soul that makes Ichigo linked to every other Quincy. He was born in the dark because he did not know about the identity of Oman Zangetsu, the lineage of his mother, and the history of the Soul Society and the Soul King. He believes that he is fighting the righteous war on the side of Ichibei and the others, but he is unaware that Ichibei was intending to turn Ichigo into the next Soul King. This lack of awareness that he has about himself and the true intentions of those that he fights alongside is what Yuhobak refers to when he describes Ichigo as being born in the dark. He did not know his ties to Yuhobak, how he was responsible for his mother's death, or the crimes that the Soul Society have committed for the sake of maintaining the balance between the worlds. Now, to further understand Yuhobak's character, it is important for us to cover everything that we know about his backstory, starting with the first chronological details that we learn about him. Yuha was born unable to see, hear, speak, or move. There was little reason to expect him to have survived but despite this, he was not afraid. As a baby, he did not cry because he was unable to use his throat. But even if he was able to, he still wouldn't have cried out like normal infants do. He knew even under these difficult circumstances that he would survive, despite the odds being stacked against him. People around him would start to treat him differently after they had realized that by touching the baby, they would be healed of their ailments. This is another similarity to Jesus, notably the miracles of Christ, which include his ability to heal others with his touch. An example 
example of one such miracle is when he had healed a blind man by placing his hands over his eyes. Similarly, as a baby, when others had touched him, Yuhubak would heal their lung function. He would fill their hearts with content if they were lonely. He would give courage to those who were apprehensive, even going as far as to restore any dismembered limbs. He was able to help others by bestowing parts of his soul to them. His soul would be imparted whenever he was touched. This had helped those who were unable to be healed by their own souls. In addition to being healed, they would gain knowledge, abilities, and talents, thanks to Yuhubak ingraining the pieces of his soul with these gifts. Those who touched him would not live long lives. Some would live for a few years or even a few days, but when they had died, the pieces of his soul that he had bestowed upon them would return to him. With each piece that had returned, he would gradually be healed of his own ailments, like his unmoving body and his unseeing eyes. Soon enough, he would have his hearing healed also, and he would notice that the people were calling him by a strange name. He had known that this was the name of the god that they had worshipped. He decided to take this name as his own, henceforth being called Yuhobak, the god who is awake. In chapter 537, we learn from Ishin that Yuhobak is the father of the Quincy. All of the Quincy originate from him. Every Quincy has the power to build up Reishi from their surroundings, turning it into their power. However, Yuhobak was different. He could share his soul with others, and he did so as a child through those who had touched him and were healed. But he had learnt of a more powerful way to share his soul, through engraving letters that represent abilities onto other souls. With this method, he was able to share a deeper and more personal part of his soul. Chapter 543 reveals that Yuobak had given himself the letter A as his shrift. 200 years after he was born, he would form a kingdom of Quincy called the Empire of Light. They would go on to conquer the northern area and burn down the forest and village where Hashwat and Basbi were from. Five years later, Yuobak would inform his aide Zedritz that he had wanted to create a new combat unit in order to conquer the Soul Society next. He would call this unit the Sternritter. In chapter 632, Yuhabak decides that Hashwat is worthy of being his right-hand man. He had recognized him as his other half. Now, 1,000 years before the present day, Yuhabak had attempted to conquer the Soul Society. During this time, he had battled against a younger head captain Yamamoto. He witnessed an unrefined version of Yamamoto's Bankai, Zankanotachi. The outcome of the battle had resulted in the defeat of the Quincy along with Yuhabak having lost his powers. It is after this defeat that the surviving Quincy would speak of an old folklore, referring to Yuhabak as the sealed Quincy King. After 900 years of being confined, the king would regain his pulse. After 90 years, he would regain his intellect. After 9 years, he would steal the power from every impure Quincy in order to regain his strength. He had done this by using his ability Ashwalin. Kanai Katagiri, Uryu's mother, and Masaki Kurosaki, Ichigo's mother, both had ended up dying because of Yuhabak. The only surviving impure Quincy was in fact Uryu Ishida. In chapter 546, Yuhabak reveals the final verse of his Emperor's Song, as he states that after nine days, he would conquer the world. Sometime during the 17 months after Aizen's defeat, Yuhabak's army, the Wandenreich, had proceeded to take over Hueco Mundo, with him personally defeating and imprisoning its leader, Tia Haribel. He had targeted Hueco Mundo because it served as the cornerstone to launch his invasion of the Soul Society. This now takes us to the events of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as during Yuhabak's first appearance, we see how ruthless and intolerant he is after he swiftly kills two of his Aranka subordinates. He killed Ludes for not following orders and Iben for no longer being of use to him after he had fulfilled his role by delaying Ichigo. He is not concerned about killing them, because if he wants more Aranka, Cars, then he could recruit them any time that he wants to, since Hueco Mundo is already under his control. In chapter 486, he is informed that Iben had unsuccessfully attempted to use his medallion to seal Ichigo's Bankai. He states that a special method must be devised in order to seal it. After he is informed that Ichigo is battling Kilge within Hueco Mundo, Yuhabak states that this is the perfect opportunity to begin their invasion of the Soul Society. We see him appear within the Sarate floating above the 13th Division. The Shinigami assumed that the enemy would attack through the gates of the Serite, but they are shocked to see Yuhabak is already inside the barrier. Suddenly, the Quincy's blue reishi explosively erupts from the ground, detonating the Shinigami, as Yuhabak without remorse states that conflicts are painful. Hashwat asks what he should do with the members of the 13th Division, who appear to have already lost their will to fight. He tells him to do as he pleases. He would even find it acceptable if he were to spare their pitiful lives. In chapter 510, after the head Captain realizes that he was in fact fighting a doppelganger of Yuhobak. He notices an explosion erupt from his first division barracks as the real Yuhobak appears behind the head captain. He appreciates the effort.
bits of the Stenritter Royd before he cremates his remains. He reveals that while Yamamoto was preoccupied, he had made his way down to Muken in order to speak to Aizen. He offered him a place within his army since he had recognized him as one of the five great war powers. Predictably, Aizen had declined his offer, but it would have been fascinating to see the two of them work together towards a common goal. He questions if Yamamoto has depleted his power after his battle with Royd, but after he attempts to use his Bankai again, Yuhabak immediately steals it with his medallion. He states that Zanka no Tachi is so powerful that nobody but the leader of the Quincy is able to handle its power. He taunts him by asking if he should use Yamamoto's Bankai to revive the corpses of the Shinigami that he has killed. After manifesting a large Reishi sword, he bids farewell to Yamamoto as he cuts him into two from across his shoulder down to his torso. Before he destroys the head captain's body, he explains to him why the Soul Society is doomed. He states that he had not listed Yamamoto as one of the five great war powers because of his refusal to take advantage of the humans by using their power for his own gain, giving the example of his refusal to allow Orihime to heal the arm that he had lost during the fake Karakura Town arc, and his reluctance to get Ichigo involved in their problems. His refusal to exploit others is evidence of how he is weaker in comparison to how he was a thousand years ago. Yuhabak recognizes the original Gotei 13 as he compliments them for being a group of fearsome individuals who would have done anything for the sake of winning. Yamamoto at the time was the only one capable of keeping this group of criminals in check. It is evident that after a century, a lot has changed. He confidently states that the Soul Society will die soon, as he tells him that the Gotei 13 had also died along with the Quincy 1000 years ago. He summons multiple arrows to rain down from above as they destroy Yamamoto's body, leaving no trace behind. He then orders the Stenritter to destroy the Soul Society as he watches over the collapse of the Serite and the defeat of the Gotei 13. Before he leaves, he is surprised to see an explosion erupt from above him as Ichigo finally arrives onto the battlefield. Hashward offers to kill him, but Yuhobak tells him they are leaving. Before they can make their exit, Ichigo's Tensa Zangetsu blade is fired into the ground in front of them as Ichigo appears before them. He is surprised that he was able to break out of Kilge's prison, but he asks if Ichigo really intends to fight in his current condition. When Ichigo asks if he is the leader of the enemy, Yuhobak questions his use of the word enemy as he states that he may or may not be. Ichigo, losing his patience, then yells out if he is the one responsible for having destroyed the Soul Society. And in response to this question, Yuhobak proudly takes responsibility for this act. Ichigo immediately charges his Reatsu and rushes to attack as the Quincy leader decides to put a stop to Ichigo here. After a failed Getsuka Tensho, Yuhobak grabs him and slams him to the ground and attempts to kill him by stabbing his throat. He tells Hashwal that Ichigo will remain alive and they will take him to their castle and revive him and place him under their command. However, he notices that his blade did not penetrate Ichigo's skin because of the Quincy defensive ability Blute Veen. An explosion erupts as Yuhabak states that he made a mistake sending a pure-blooded Quincy to delay Ichigo. He should have sent an Arankar after him. Because of his failure to account for this, the memory within his spiritual pressure has awakened. He explains how Kilge's spiritual pressure had been absorbed deep into Ichigo's soul when he was trapped within his prison, desperately trying to escape. When Ichigo is confused at the notion that he may be a Quincy, Yuhabak states that he knows nothing about himself or his own mother. Before he gives him any answers, he states that he will force him into submission and take him back to the castle and educate him about his life. After clashing, he grabs Ichigo's head and is about to strike him with his full power this time, so he is unable to block this even with Blute Veen. However, he has stopped from completing his attack when his time outside of the shadow area is up. He has to return to the Wandon Reich. He realizes that Aizen had messed with his perception of time when he had briefly visited him. Before leaving, he tells Ichigo that he will be back for him, and in the meantime, he should heal his wounds and wait for his return, referring to him as his son born in the dark. In chapter 537, Uryu is welcomed by Yuhabak as their new recruit. Not too long after joining, Yuhabak announces to the other Quincy that Uryu has been appointed as his successor. He reassures the others that they will come to learn about Uryu's true power during their upcoming fights. Within his chambers, he completes the ceremony with Uryu as he bestows upon him a shrift with a letter A. He explains to him that he has been appointed as his successor because he had survived Ashwalin when all of the other impure Quincy had not. He is in fact the only person to have ever survived this ability. He reveals that Uryu has potential to one day surpass his own power, thus explaining why he is a worthy heir to the Quincy throne. Chapter 546 marks the beginning of the Quincy's second invasion, as Yuhabak along with Hashwad and Uryu appear within the Soul Society. He tells the two of them that the world will end in nine 
days. The Serite disappears as it's replaced with Silburn, the large palace of the Wandan Reich. Yorbak explains that when the Quincy had lost a thousand years ago, they had nowhere left to go, so they had fled from the world of the living into the Serite, to a place where the Shinigami would least expect to find them. They had used Reishi to create spaces inside the shadows of the Serite, thus explaining why he refers to the Wandan Reich as the Invisible Empire. After the Shinigami figure out a way to restore their stolen Bankai, Yuhobak explains to Uryu that he had predicted that this would happen. In retaliation, several Stenritas activate their holy forms, as their leader watches, stating that the Shinigami will now experience true despair. In chapter 559, BG9 and Kangdu are tied up and brought before Yuhobak, as he states that he will judge every Stenritter who has lost. They end up pleading with him that they had survived thanks to the activation of their holy form, which had revived them. They argue that they can still fight for him, as Yuhobak tells them that they should feel fortunate that they have survived. After Ichigo arrives within the Serete, Yuhobak has Hashwalt summon a key, as he explains that the clothes that Ichigo is wearing have an immense defensive power, because they are made from the bones and the hair of the royal guard. This is how Ichigo was able to break through the 72 barriers that exist between the royal palace and the Soul Society. He reveals that the barriers that were broken do not reform until 6,000 seconds have passed, thus giving him an opening to enter into the royal palace. In chapter 587, Yuhabak along with Hashwad and Uryu arrive in the royal palace via the beam of light that pierced through the heavens. Hashwad assumes that Yuhabak must be feeling emotional now that they have arrived at the Soul King's palace, but he states that he does not feel any emotion from being here, as he describes the royal palace as a decaying grave. Tanjiro Karinji confronts them as he releases his Zanpakuto and attacks Yuhabak, but he fails to land any blows. He is then confronted by Senjumaru, who surrounds him with his soldiers, who attack him but again they are unable to hit him. After the stern return, Neanzo Weasel appears from the ground and is killed by Senjumaru. Yuhabak claims that he can now be harmed by their attacks. He summons several soldat from his shadows to battle Senjumaru's soldiers, then proceeding to summon his elite soldiers, the Shootstaffel, Gerard, Lil, Pernida, and Askin. Nimaya swiftly defeats the Shootstaffel before turning his attention towards their leader. Yuhabak then activates Ashwanen as he steals the life force and power from the Stenritters in the Serite, so that he can revive his Shootstaffel, who proceed to defeat Nimaya and the other members of the Royal Guard. Yuhabak then confronts Ichibei after he breaks free from Kiryo Hikifune's Cage of Life. He refers to him by his name, asking whether he will allow him to pass or not. Ichibei advises him not to speak of his name so lightly, because in doing so will lead to his throat being crushed. When the leader of the Zero Division draws a line on the ground, stating that this is where he will be defeated, Yuhabak tells him that he in fact is the one who will die just short of three steps behind this line. Suddenly, a giant hand appears in front of him, pushing him back 300 miles with incredible force. When Yuhabak tries to speak, he realizes that he cannot. He is then pushed downward by another hand, and while he is hurtling down to the ground, he pierces his fingers into his throat, thus restoring his voice. He then summons several Quincy arrows and an oversized bow with the ability Sanct Bogen. Firing the arrows into the air, one of them pierces his chest, sending him hurtling through the air towards Ichibe, as the leader of the Zero Division is left with no choice but to state that he will have to kill Yuhabak. After clashing, he notes how Ichibe's face has changed after deciding to kill him, commenting on how he seems to be pleased with his menacing grin. After he blocks an attack from Ichibe's brushed-shaped Zanpakuto, he learns that his opponent Zanpakuto has the power to cut names, as his arm falls to his side. He has cut the physical ability of his arm in half, making it feel heavier and difficult to use. He attempts to swing his sword, but it is slower and more gentle, allowing Ichibe to land a critical hit across Yuhabak's body. He has cut his power in half off just now, asking how he feels after having been smashed into pieces by the leader of the Shinigami. You can see an incredible contrast in their emotions, as it is difficult to cheer for Ichibe, the individual who is fighting for the side of good, because he has these sinister expressions on his face. Yuhobak smiles back as Reishi begins to build up around him. He feels honoured that the leader of the Shinigami deemed him to be such a threat that his powers had needed to be cut in half. He declares that he can give himself back the power that was taken from him, stating that everything 
everything in this world is his to take. He summons pillars of Reishi from the ground, firing them towards Ichibe, who blocks the attack by absorbing it into his hands. He then summons a Bakudo spell that Yuhabak blocks with his Blutveen and Haben ability. This is a protective barrier that expends from outside of his body. His defensive barrier is then easily broken by Ichibe's technique Tepusatsu. After he grabs him by the throat, Yuhabak reveals that the Anhaben power destroys anything that comes into contact with his body, allowing him to further expand his Blute Veen as he demonstrates with Blute Veen running up Ichibe's arm over the left side of his body. His veins end up pushing back his Blute Veen as it flows back into Yuhabak, rupturing his face. After Ichibe decides that he has had enough of him, he activates his Shikai Ichimonji. They begin clashing as he notices that Ichibe is doing nothing but spraying black ink everywhere, as he then is shocked by the revelation that anything that is covered by his ink will lose its name. That which has no name has no power, but he then attempts to steal Ichibe's power with his Saint Altar ability. Now while Yuhabak had in fact stolen Ichibe's powers here, he states that the power that he had stolen does not belong to him, since after having unleashed his Shikai, it means that anything black within the world now belongs to Ichibe. He then strikes him across his face with his brush, covering it in ink. He then activates his Bankai Shirafude Ichimonji, as he uses his white brush to assign him the name Ant, meaning that Yuhabak has no more power than an ordinary black ant. He then sends him flying through the floor with a giant foot before intercepting him in mid-air with two giant hands that come together to crush him. Just when it seems as though he has been defeated, Yuhabak bursts out from the ground and recovers thanks to his ability the Almighty. During this battle, Hashward explains to Uryu that up until now, Yuhabak has been fighting against Ichibei with his eyes closed. He states that it was necessary for Yuhabak to regain his strength after nine years because if he were to have opened his eyes before this, then his Almighty would have gone out of control and may have even robbed the Steinritters of their power. He explains that their leader had only kept his eyes shut for their sake, because now that he has used the Almighty against Ichibe, it means that his nine years for his strength to be regained have ended. We finally get to see the true power of Yuha, as it is revealed that the Almighty allows him to see into the future, as well as every power and ability that he is aware of will now take his side, so he cannot be hurt or defeated by them. This is the utterly broken power of Yuha Buck. When Ichibe activates his power, the Magnificent Death Mausoleum, and tries to use the black on his body to defeat him, Yuhabak reveals to him that he has now regained his name and power, so Ichibe's technique is useless against him. He reminds him that his name is Yuhabak, and he is the one who will rob him of everything. He attacks him with a blast that explodes his body with his limbs scattered across the floor, as he states that he was correct with his promise of killing Ichibe three steps behind the line that he had drawn. Now with his Zero Division defeated, he turns his attention towards the Soul King, stating that it is now his time to fall. In chapter 612, he finally confronts the Soul King after killing the remaining gods that were protecting him. He refers to the Soul King as an imperfect god who is unable to escape his fate. He refers to his father's existence as humiliating and declares that he will bring an end to it. This moment conveys to us a brief glimpse at a remorseful Yuhabak, who believes that his father's life was robbed from him. He extends his mercy by deciding to end his life, as he says that perhaps Perhaps the Soul King had foreseen that his own son would avenge him and be the one to end his suffering. He bids farewell to him as he refers to the Soul King as his father who has seen the future. In the following chapter, he is confronted by Ichigo as once again Yuhabak offers his mercy by stating that he will end Ichigo's life before Ichibe can do the unthinkable to him. Now what I'm about to speak about is only hinted at within the manga. When Yuhabak whispers Ichibe's title High Priest to himself just after Ichigo arrives at the Soul King's palace, we find out why he was referring to to Ichibe in this moment through the Can't Fear Your Own World light novels, which explained that Ichibe had intended to transform Ichigo into the next Soul King. As I have explained, this is a fate worse than death. Yuhabak states that Ichigo will ultimately be crushed by the cogs of fate, which are sending him down a path where he will be a part of Ichibe's twisted desire. This is why Yuhabak says that he will be the one to lay him to rest. As a villain, we truly understand and appreciate Yuhabak more with this added context. The Soul Society is built on corruption and lies. At the center of it all are the five great noble families and the leader of all of the Shinigami, Ichibe. Again, people would not be as confused about Yuhabak's motive if only they were given this crucial context 
context that is not within the manga. After Ichigo announces his intention to stop him, Yuobak says that he has already foreseen this. He was aware that Ichigo would try to stop him from killing the Soul King. It is here where Ichigo notices something different about Yuhabak's eyes, as he now appears to have three irises and pupils. Yuhabak explains that these eyes see all, and they are the proof of a true Quincy. He goes on to reveal that he was aware that Ichigo and the others have resurrected Ichibe before coming here, and it was the leader of the Shinigami who had convinced them to challenge Yuhabak. He was already aware that Ichigo would not arrive in time, as he turns that attention towards an impaled Soul King, stating that he is dead and that there is nothing that they can do for him now. Ichigo rushes to pull out the sword that has impaled him, but after doing so, the Quincy blood flowing through Ichigo's veins compels him to cut the Soul King in two. Yuhabak explains that his blood carries within it Yuhabak's desire to never accept the existence of the Soul King. This is why his body acted against his will. He welcomes Ichigo and the others to now witness the end of the Soul Society as the Serite and the world of the living begin to collapse. After letting go of Yuhabak's sword, Ichigo draws his own Zanpakuto and charges towards the enemy, but the attack is easily blocked as Yuha asks him if he still has a reason to fight him, considering that the Soul Society's fate is now sealed, since it is crumbling as they speak. He explains that the Soul King was made to stabilize the Soul Society, where souls would reincarnate into after their deaths. Now that he is no more, everything connected to and including the Soul Society will collapse. He makes sure to remind Ichigo that this has been done by his hand. Yuhabak is then surrounded by several sharp wires thanks to Yoriichi, as she tells Orihime to heal the Soul King with her power, but it ends up being of no use. Her Soten Kishun shatters around the Soul King. Yuhabak exclaims that no mere human can restore the Soul King. He confidently states that he will never be brought back to life, but in chapter 617, he is surprised to see Ukitake's Kamikake appear within the Soul King's palace. As it wraps itself around the Soul King, he recognizes that this is the work of his right hand Mimihagi. He demands to know why it is getting in the way. He questions if the Soul King has suddenly become attached to the Soul Society, that his own right hand is now helping to restore him. He tries to destroy Mimihagi and the Soul King, but is stopped by Ichigo. He questions why is it that he is trying to stop him. After all, it was Ichigo who had killed the Soul King. The blood that is flowing through Ichigo will not allow him to accept the Soul King's existence. But Ichigo declares that he has come to stop Yuhabak and to protect the realms of reality which are stabilized by the Soul King. Yuha calls him arrogant as he questions if Ichigo truly believes that nobody but him is capable of this task. Ichigo states that even if somebody else could do it, that does not mean that he will sit aside and do nothing about it. Ichigo fires a Getsuka Tensha towards him as he refuses to carry out his will, even if the Quincy blood is flowing through him. But Yuha states that Ichigo's actions and even the future as a whole will be decided by his eyes alone. He tells him that it was never his intention to force Ichigo to do his bidding, but because his will is connected to his own, Yuobak reveals that Ichigo has been fighting for him this entire time. All of the battles that he has fought serve to increase his power, which was used to defeat Aizen. And then, even after losing his power, Ichigo regained them so that he could take the Soul King's life by his own hands. Yuha goes on to say that his eyes reflect an image of Ichigo fighting for his sake. This is because of their shared Quincy blood. Ichigo refuses to accept that having Quincy blood made him act for the will of the Quincy leader, as he resolves to stop Yuhabak. But Yuha asks him if he really is his enemy, questioning his use of the word stop, instead of declaring to kill the man who was responsible for his mother's death. He states that this is a sign of weakness. After Uryu arrives and attacks Yoriichi, it causes a barrier around the Soul King to shatter. Yuha then grabs the top half of the Soul King as he has Pranida twist and destroy Yoriichi's arm before throwing her off of the Soul King's palace. Uryu then distracts Ichigo which gives Yuha enough time to remove Mimihagi from the Soul King. After Ichigo and company are thrown off of the palace by Uryu, we see Mimihagi attempt to attack Yuha. He questions if the right arm really wants to stop his own son, before destroying and absorbing its power, as the collapse of reality now resumes. He declares that he will take everything from the Soul King, as he fires a blast of darkness down towards the Serite, which spreads over the area covering it in darkness. Yuha then dissolves into a black mass of one-eyed creatures. Hashward explains that these creatures are a result of the overflow of power from Yuhabak after he had absorbed the Soul King. The newly formed beings begin to rain down onto the Serite, with their enemy being the Shinigami. At the end of chapter 625, we witness Yuha completely absorb the Soul King, as he is now clothed with darkness and the top half of his face being covered with eyes. He states that he is now overflowing with power, as he builds a new country for the Quincy by transforming the Soul King's palace into his very own fortress called 
Waherweld. Hashward informs Yuha that Ichigo and the Gotei 13 have returned, as he orders his men to kill the enemy so that they can actualize the future that is reflected in his eyes. We briefly see Yuha again in chapter 635, when he awakens from his sleep to quickly kill the Stenritters Lil Toto and Giselle, who confront their leader because of feeling betrayed by him, when he had casted Ashwalin to take the power of the Stenritters to revive the Shoot Starfall. This of course was the very first glimpse that Yuhabak cares very little for those who work for him. They are all nothing but disposable commodities to him. While he is asleep, we learn in chapter 672 that he had a vision of Ichigo cutting him in two. He wakes up at the dawn of a new day as his powers return to him, and he smiles at the thought of having a nightmare. But we later learn that this was not a dream but an actual vision of the future which Yuhabak had ignored. At the end of the chapter, he greets Ichigo who once again confronts him, as he refers to him as his son of darkness. He can see Ichigo's reatsu overflowing around him, as he admits that he has gotten stronger, stating that this is the power that he was supposed to have. Yuha says that he wants to enjoy his long-awaited battle with his son, but Ichigo states that he is not his father. He then reminds Ichigo that he is the source of all Quincy powers, but Ichigo once again states that he is not his father. He is actually the one who was responsible for his mother's death. Ichigo draws his blade and fires a Getsuke Tensho at him, but it is blocked by Yuhobat's Reatsu that extends out to attack Ichigo, but he ends up being protected by Orihime's barrier. The black, vine-like Reatsu pushes past his shield, but it ends up being cut in half by Ichigo, who once again charges towards Yuha, who tells him that there is nothing to be sad about. His mother was supposed to have died the way that she did. She had given birth to Ichigo and then lived for the sake of Yuha. What more could she have asked for? After absorbing the Soul King, Yuha proves that he has become more maniacal, as he laughs out that there is no greater happiness than the sacrifice of the Quincy for their leader. At the end of chapter 673, he sends Ichigo flying into a wall, as he stands up surrounded by his sinister black Reatsu, stating that their conversation is now over, and he will now showcase his true power. Ichigo recklessly gets back up and charges towards him as Yuha tells him not to be so impatient, because his death is inevitable and there is no need to rush towards it. He tells him that it took many miracles to create him, so he shouldn't be ungrateful for having such little regard for his own life. He reveals that Ichigo's body and powers never belong to him, as he surrounds him with his Reatsu. As the battle continues, Ichigo repeatedly gets back up and rushes towards him. Yuha is confused about why he is rushing to his death. He questions whether if Ichigo is hesitant to reveal this true power because he is afraid that it will be taken from him. Yuha tells him that if he dies here, then the real world, Soul Society and Hueco Mundo are finished, because he will destroy them all. When Orihime begins to heal Ichigo, Yuha notes how she represents the voices of the weak and powerless who want Ichigo to continue to fight. He blasts more Reatsu towards him and tells him to stand up and fight so that he can showcase his true power and die for the sake of his allies. Ichigo notices that the tip of his Zanbakdo is now turning white. He then calls out to Orihime as she blocks Yuhabak's next attack as an explosion of Reatsu erupts and we see Ichigo appear from the clouds of dust in a new semi-holified form that fans refer to as his Horn of Salvation form. Yuha comments on how Ichigo now resembles a hollow, confirming that this new form originates from the hollow that is fused with his powers. Ichigo explains to him the reforged nature of his Zanbakdo and how his hollow and Quincy powers had found equilibrium. Yuha smiles after hearing how Ichigo activated this new form. They once again begin to clash as Ichigo grabs him and cuts him at close range, but he ends up blocking the attack with his bare hand. The force of his attack is so powerful that it destroys the Quincy tower that they are in. He pushes him back as he states that he cannot be hurt by his level of power. However, Ichigo then fuses his Getsuka Tensho with a Grand Ray Sero and fires it at him. As the attack lands perfectly, cutting deep into Yuhabak, he ends up grabbing the attack with both of his hands and repelling it, as he exclaims that he is out of his league. He then activates the Almighty, because he doesn't want to underestimate Ichigo's power in his new form. He compliments his new form, stating that it is truly a magnificent power. This is why he must not let his guard down. After repeatedly clashing with Ichigo, he draws his second sword and strikes, but Yuhabak also creates a second blade and pushes Ichigo back. When he lands on the ground, his feet are impaled by black blades made up of Yuhabak's reishi. They seem to be traps that were set up on every surface that Ichigo is landing onto. The Quincy leader strikes down at him, but he avoids the attack, as he then reminds him that his power allows him to see the future. Ichigo questions if that is the case, then why did his last attack not connect? Yuha smiling strikes towards him again, but he avoids the attack as he thinks to himself that his power must have a limitation. Yuha 
Hawk correctly assumes that Ichigo must be looking for a hole in his ability, going on to say that he must believe that he can change the future to his favor during their fight, into a possible future that Yuhobak has not already foreseen. He tells Ichigo to stand still if he believes this to be true, as he is then stabbed by several black reishi blades extending from the wall behind him, causing him to fall down to the ground. Appearing behind him, Yuha explains that the future does not lie on a single path. Rather, he explains it to be like the grains of sand that are scattering before him. Each one of those grains is an isolated future, meaning that there are countless possibilities. He tells Ichigo that he enjoys speaking of hope, because it is true that the future can be changed, and this is a fact filled with a lot of hope. It is similar to how Ichigo grows after each battle, but changing the future means jumping from one grain of sand to the next. The limitation to this form of hope is that Yuha can see every grain of sand from high above. He tells Ichigo to not give up hope and to stay the way that he is. He tells him to continue jumping from one grain of sand to the next as he desperately avoids his fate. This is after all his way of expressing hope. He advises him not to lose this hope because he would find it far too painful to kill his child while he is in despair. Ichigo explains he knows all that there is to know about despair as he activates his newfound Bankai. Immediately after Ichigo activates his new Tensa Zangetsu, Yuhobak ends up breaking his blade in two with his hand. This causes Ichigo to be completely stunned as to how he was able to do this without even moving. He tells Ichigo not to look so grim. He was, after all, paying respect to his power. The new Tensa Zangetsu is an incredible Bankai, he admits. One that he did not want to waste any time getting rid of. He had, in fact, broken Ichigo's Bankai in the future. He then breaks off his horn and fires it towards him, but Ichigo blocks the attack with what little power that he has left of his Bankai. Yuha then appears behind him and sends him crashing down to the ground, as he once again appears before him and cuts him with his blade, pushing it back against a wall. When he is about to attack him again, Orihime protects Ichigo with a barrier, but despite this, Ichigo still ends up being hit by the attack, as he reveals that the Almighty is not the ability to just see into the future, but it has the power to alter the future. This is the truly broken power that Yuhobak possesses. After all hope seems to be lost, he tells him not to start losing hope and sinking into despair now. He explains that the Almighty is no different from his and Orihime's ability. Just as the two of them can intervene with the moment that they can see in front of them, Yuhobak on the other hand can intervene with every future that is reflected onto his eyes. He tells Ichigo that he has overcome despair and changed the future several times, but this was only possible because Yuhobak wasn't there to stop him. He wants Ichigo to try and change the future into something magnificent, but whatever it may be, he will always be there watching it, and he will tear apart the future that Ichigo has desperately fought for. He once again tells him not to despair, as all hope is now lost, leading to Ichigo yelling out in frustration. Yuha throws him across the air as Ichigo coughs up blood. He is then picked up and asked by Yuha if he has given up. It seems as though Ichigo has indeed lost all hope for winning after he realizes that his sword is ineffective. Orihime's shields are useless. He admits to himself that it is truly over. Yuha then expresses his disappointment as he takes back the Quincy and Hollow powers that he had given to him. Ichigo ends up returning to his normal form as he falls to the ground. Yuobak laughs hysterically as this sadistic side to his personality once again cranks up a notch. He then activates his third Ashwalan, which drains the power from his most loyal subordinates, the Shoot Starfall and his right hand man Hashwald. Their power is sent to the top of Waherworld, where Yuhobak creates a portal for him to enter into the Serite, as he tells Ichigo that he no longer needs him or his children the Sternritters, meaning that he has used them just to get to where he is now. He aims to now go through the portal so that he can crush the Soul Society and the world of the living. After he sees that Renji and Rukia have appeared onto the battlefield, he expresses his annoyance that so many weaklings have been sent after him. He arrogantly leaves the portal open, just in case if they should choose to pursue him, as he states that he will reward them with a magnificent death if they decide to bravely go after him. His malice has no limits, as he threatens them by describing how he will kill them in their single most happiest moment in the future. So from this moment onwards, any joy that they will feel will cause them to remember Yuhobak's words, and every time they will feel the fear of death that has been promised to them. These words are incredibly sickening, but they were so superbly written and executed by Kubo, and this is easily one of the most chilling threats that I have ever read in any story. Typically, death is the last thing that you associate with happiness, but Yuhobak's threat subverts this as he makes others feel the fear of death in every moment of their lives, a fear that he will no longer have to worry about after having absorbed the Soul King and effectively becoming immortal. This is a testament to the warped mentality of this villain, and his own fears being projected onto others. It is an impressive way to 
write a villain, as it makes you appreciate the hero's struggle against him that much more, especially when all hope seems to have been lost. In chapter 682, Yuhabak arrives at the Serete, where he meets Aizen sitting on his chair. He welcomes him to his soul society, as he takes ownership over the very area that Yuhabak is seeking to now destroy. After getting rid of his restraints, the freed Aizen expresses his surprise at how Yuhabak seems to have struggled with Ichigo, but he advises him to stop projecting his own troubles onto him. After all, it was Aizen who was defeated by Ichigo. He ends up thanking him for destroying that chair as he now states that he will be the one to stop him. Yuha rightfully comments on how it is strange that Aizen would fight for the sake of the Soul Society, but Aizen explains that he will crush anyone who seeks to control him. Suddenly, Ichigo and Renji appear behind Yuha, but he evades their attack as he states that he had foresaw their arrival, including Ichigo restoring his blade and coming here only to have it broken again. When Yuha tries to break his Tensar Zangetsu again, he notices how it is just cracked and not broken. He states that Ichigo is very fortunate. After having pushed back Ichigo with a blast of Reatsu, he says it is difficult for him to see Ichigo like this, as he asks why he did not have his wounds healed by Orihime. He reminds him that there is nothing that he can change by being here. This includes Renji and his Bankai too. He states that every Bankai has already been destroyed by him in the future, so they are now rendered useless against him. He decides to set an example out of Ichigo and Renji, as he personally wants to crush the two of them, so that they understand that there is no hope. He cuts off Renji's left arm, but he is then intercepted by Aizen, who lunges towards him. Yuha then laughs at how he is protecting Renji, as he wonders, wasn't it Aizen who thought lowly of people who work together in the face of a common threat? The Kido Master Aizen then activates his incredibly powerful Hado number 99, Goryu Tenmetsu. Yuha draws Aizen's attention to his own Zanbakdo, as he comments on how it has already been broken. He attacks him and appears to have gotten rid of him, as Ichigo then attempts to surprise prize attack Yuha. Strangely enough, we see that Ichigo no longer has his left arm with him, as Yuha apologizes to Ichigo as he compliments him and how he had read the situation and did well to fight alongside Aizen, but not even Kyokasu Yigetsu is a match against his power. He theorizes how it was Renji who was blown away by his black Reatsu, and it was Ichigo's arm that had been torn off next. He confidently states that he has seen it all, as he shatters Ichigo's Zambakdo and fires a hole straight through his body, delivering a fatal final blow. He bids farewell to Ichigo, stating that his resistance was soothing. At least he can now perish along with the Soul Society. But just when it seems as though he has won, it is revealed that Yuha hadn't impaled Ichigo, and this entire time he was actually fighting against Aizen. He was under his Kyokasu Getsu from the very start of their encounter. It was Aizen who had his arm severed, and the hole blasted through his body. Just then, Yuha is impaled from behind by Ichigo, as he simultaneously fires an intense Getsuka Tensho through his body, cutting him in half. Yuha dissolves into the ground as it seems as though he has been defeated. However, Yuha returns as his black mass surrounds Aizen. He comments on him lowering his guard by undoing the effects of Kyokasu Getsu too soon. He reforms his body and asks if Ichigo really thought that he had won. He reminds him that he can alter the future, including rewriting the future in which he dies. Ichigo persistently charges towards him again, but his Tensa Zangetsu is held out of his hand. As Yuhabak's black mass begins to engulf Ichigo and all of reality, he declares that the worlds will now collapse and become one. However, he is then interrupted when Uryu fires the still silver arrowhead through his heart. We find out that the silver clot that forms within the heart of those who have been affected by Ashwalin is extremely potent to the caster of the ability, especially when it is mixed with their blood. Only for a brief moment, it causes the individual's powers to cease to exist. And it is in this moment that Ichigo takes advantage of the situation and delivers the final decisive blow to Yuhabak. He realizes after seeing Zangetsu that the dream that he had earlier was indeed a vision of the future and not a nightmare. Hashwat had in fact tried to warn him about this with the dream that he had, but Yuobak had ignored it. In chapter 686, we see him grab Zangetsu as he tells Ichigo that the path to a world without fear has now been sealed. He states that Hueko Mundo, Soul Society, and the world of the living should have all become one, resulting in life and death being combined as one. But that can no longer happen now. He sarcastically thanks Ichigo for this. He is disappointed that because of him, life and death will retain their current forms. Every life form will now continue to exist while constantly in a fear of their own death. So now that we know his involvement within the manga, let's dive into the fate of Yuhobak after chapter 686, as well as diving into the reasons behind his motives. Within the Can't For Your Own World light novels, we learned that in the beginning there only existed one realm, and death did not exist. There was no 
differentiation between the body or the soul. It was a fairly peaceful existence. However, souls could still grow and even become hollows eventually. And if a soul was devoured by a hollow, then it would be lost forever, since it would be broken down to feed the hollow. Before too long, the first Quincy, the Soul King, was born. He was thought to be the strongest being in the universe. He had maintained peace by killing any hollows who would seek to devour souls. However, despite the strength of the Soul King, it did not stop new hollows from being born in this singular world. To combat this problem, a powerful group had decided that they had wanted to trap the hollows in a realm of their own, while simultaneously maintaining a small transfer of souls between the worlds so that they can keep the balance. Their plan led to them ambushing the Soul King and dismembering his limbs, and stealing most of his power for themselves as they reshaped this singular reality into one with three realms. It is said that the Soul King did not defend himself. He allowed this to happen. We eventually learn that this powerful group who forged this plan were in fact the five great noble families who worked alongside Ichibe. The main body of the Soul King ended up being imprisoned and he became a linchpin who holds the three realms together, while the cut limbs of his body will be reincarnated into different people via the cycle of reincarnation. Small fractions of the Soul King may be linked to certain individuals like Rangiku, while larger portions like Mimihagi were given to individuals like Ukitake. Yuha desired to return things back to the singular reality, meaning that souls would transform into hollows randomly, but the Quincy would have no problem with this since their attacks not only destroy the hollow but the soul also, while on the other hand Shinigami would be rendered useless since their power serves to cleanse a hollow and send its accompanying soul to the soul society. Without this cleansing taking place, the Shinigami army would have little chance against the hollows, since in the singular reality they need to be permanently destroyed. Ichibe and the Soul Society want to maintain this artificially created three realm reality, which was built upon lies and betrayal. Their current reality ensures that every soul will experience death and suffer from aging. We are aware that Yuhabak was the son of the Soul King, and after hearing what the Soul Society did to his father, we can appreciate his actions better. He had desired to end his father's suffering and to prevent anything like this happening again. During Bleach's final arc, Yuhabak was made out to be a merciless, sinister villain. But from the perspective of the Quincy, who had known about the truth of reality, he was their hero, who ended up building an army to challenge those who are protecting this false state of reality. Yuhabak fought and defeated several key figures like Yamamoto, Ichibe, and even Ichigo several times in order to enact his plan. Ichigo would not have been able to defeat Yuhabak without the combined help of Uryu, Ginjo, Tsukishima, Aizen, and even even including Ishin and Ryuken. Now continuing on with what we learned from Can't Fear Your Own World, we find out that Yuhabak was turned into the next Soul King. He became the very thing that he had pitied. He took the place of his father and would go on to lead the most humiliating of existences. Contrastingly, the Soul King did not fight back when he was ambushed, as opposed to Yuhabak who fought against everything that the Shinigami stand for. This makes you really question what is right and wrong, and if the heroes we have been rooting for this entire time were actually on the side of good, especially after we learn about the disgraceful history of the Soul Society. If you ask me, it would have made a lot of sense for this material to have been included within the manga, as it is all vital to understanding the lore of Bleach, as well as Yuhabak's motives within the final arc. Without this backstory, I can appreciate why people feel confused about his character, and why he is playing the role of a villain within the Thousand Year Blood War arc. It is only after deeper inspection that we learn that Yuhabak had felt that his father, the Soul King, was humiliated by the Shinigami, and he had wanted to end his suffering, and the only way for him to do so was to kill the Soul King out of compassion. However, unlike Aizen who had Ichigo to understand his loneliness, Yuhobak on the other hand didn't have anyone left to understand the reasoning behind his actions. In the end, he truly suffered a tragic fate. After having lived a life hailed as a king and a miraculous saviour who had the power to heal others and bestow power upon them. Speaking about his power, Yuhobak is criticised for possessing one of the most broken abilities in the entire series. The Almighty allows him to change the outcome of a future to directly affect the present. He does not have the power to just see the future, but to alter it completely. This power emphasises the futility of notions like free will, in the eyes of an omnipotent and omnipresent god. This is essentially the premise behind Ichigo vs Yuhabak, as Ichigo represents mortals and he symbolises the concept of free will, while Yuhabak represents a god who is symbolic of omniscience. This now dives us straight into the age-old philosophical debate about omniscience and free will, and if they are fundamentally compatible with one another. How is it that a mortal has free will to make choices, while at the same time God already knows what that choice is going to be? In the context of Bleach, if Yuhabak already knows every 
everything, including the future, then does Ichigo really have free will to fight back and win against him? Through Bleach, Kubo argues that a mortal, through their free will, can choose an alternative path that is not known by a god. Yuhobak was a malevolent, godlike being who spoke about absolutes because he could see every possible outcome from a higher plane. He ridiculed mortals for clinging onto concepts like hope and going against fate, while this was the basic premise behind how he had obtained his own strength and power. His miraculous touch allowed his believers to be bestowed with power that altered their fates. The blind who were able to see, the powerless who had power, and those who were depressed would find contentment in their hearts. Yuha was created off of the back of these concepts that he ridicules. Imagine if people did not have hope for their future and had refused to believe that he could heal them. He would not have gained the power to see, hear, and even move himself. What of his followers who diligently awaited his return after 1000 years, remaining concealed within the shadows, hoping for his return? While his motive is understandable, his actions lead you to have little to no sympathy for him through his ungrateful arrogance and how he frankly became drunk on his own power. I felt no remorse for him after his defeat. I did however feel sorry for him after learning that he was now the new Soul King. So it is inevitable that there is going to be a lot of comparison between Aizen and Yuhobak, especially with the new anime coming back, and considering that they are the two key antagonistic forces within Bleach. Some people have stated that Aizen was very well fleshed out, and we got to see him grow into the role of the big bad villain, while Yuhobak didn't get enough setup or screen time, and he just turned up as the next villain in the story. Yuha was the type of character who did not play around with his opponents. Aizen, on the other hand, took pleasure in manipulating his targets and toying around with them. Yuha immediately got down to business by destroying the Soul Society, killing Yamamoto, reaching the Royal Palace, and even killing the Soul King. This is far more than what Aizen had accomplished. However, Aizen was loved by fans for his manipulative and mischievous personality. His tricks and games were a huge draw to his character. Yuha I like to describe as being menacing, unforgiving, and a total manifestation of vengeance. He unleashed hell upon the Soul Society after his prophesied return. The Quincy King for centuries was nothing but an old folklore. The surviving Quincy had known of the tale of the Thousand Year Prayer, which would be answered when Yuha had finally returned. He was like an unstoppable force that continued creeping forward to fulfill his desire. He has an overwhelming, suffocating presence, which was further amplified after he had absorbed the Soul King. Now while they are two entirely different characters, I don't think that anyone should overlook Yuhobak's character. After all, it is via his character arc that we learn pivotal information that links together the missing pieces of Bleach's history and lore. His efficient execution of his plan led to the stakes being higher than ever, as the Soul Society was forever changed by the first invasion of the Quincy, which was of course led by him. Immediately at the onset of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, we understood the severity of the situation and the meaning of war through Yuhobak's cruel but calculated actions. In comparison to Aizen, the Quincy and their leader were far more organized and worked better together than Aizen and his Arankar. It felt as though the Espada were very self-centered and were concerned about themselves, while demonstrating their loyalty to Aizen in varying degrees. However, all of the Quincy's had obeyed Yuhobak not only because they had feared him, but because they had respected him greatly. I can't say that one antagonist is better than the other because I love both Aizen and Yuhobak, and they went about their respective motives in very different ways, which added to the unpredictability of both of their respective arcs that they feature within. Now, to wrap up my thoughts on Yuhobak's character, I would have liked to have seen more of his backstory and a build-up of his character leading up to this current iteration of him that we see during the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Like seeing the events of the original war between the Quincy and Shinigami, seeing more of his thoughts and feelings on the Soul King being the linchpin, the information that is explained within Cotton for Your Own World being told within the manga, as it would have further helped to explain Yuhobak's motives. Now, I can only hope that we do get to see these things within the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime, as it would be a shame to miss out on these key aspects of his character. Yuhobak was an individual who could heal the ailments of others just with his touch. He was defeated long ago and had remained dormant for 1000 years only to remain and exact his revenge against the enemy who had grown complacent over time, while he and his army had been preparing after having learnt the merciless ways of the original Gotei 13. He was in the end defeated by Ichigo who once again proved to overcome his despair, defy fate and demonstrate an unlimited supply of courage to defeat the one who had wanted to rid the concept of death from reality itself. He ultimately failed to realise the significance of leading a hopeful existence while fending off the fear of death. Aizen in the final chapter of Bleach says that while fear would certainly have not existed in the world that Yuobak had wished for, 
all. However, in this kind of world, people would have no reason to search for hope. They would live for the sake of living, since there would be no end to their existence. However, persisting while fending off the fear of death is something entirely different. Mortals have a special name for it. They call it courage. The very courage that Ichigo had built up inside himself in order to bring an end to Yuhabak and his plans. He did all of this without being bestowed or gifted with courage by Yuhabak. Despite a fraction of his powers having come from him, it was only Ichigo who could build up that courage to defeat him. Now we have finally reached the point of this video where I want to hand over the discussion to all of you. What did you think of the leader of the Quincy, Yuhabak? Was he a great endgame villain? Did you enjoy his character as much as I did? Or did you feel as though there was something lacking? Definitely let me know your thoughts in the comments. And lastly, thank you for making it to the end of this incredibly long video. I just hope that it was worth your time. And I look forward to seeing you in my next Bleach character analysis video. If you enjoy my content, then you can support my channel through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month, or even through YouTube by becoming a channel member. You will gain access to exclusive channel perks and a Discord server which I frequently use. So become a member of my Zero Division and be the first to know about my upcoming videos. And once again, thank you for sticking around till the end of the video and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me.